Yeah. You want to pass the board? That's yes. good. Yeah. I see. I see. Yeah. So, how long is your process? Uh, so this talk consists of two parts. The first part is just my few sentences of Michael Cohen. I have been working with him for a long time, and I just want to. Oh, the next part I will use the whiteboard, but but maybe it's better for the picture. So the second part of the talk will be a collaboration with Michael, uh, Sebastian Bubek, I. I Lee and both, and then, so for the last, this summer, it is kind of really fortunate to work with Michael, especially, it is lucky to see how he do research, it is basically like this. Uh, uh, first part of the talk mainly speak to those people who don't know Michael. For those people who know Michael, it is obvious. Uh, so uh, for those who don't know about Michael, in the la he, he is still a, he was a PhD student for just finished his third year, and he just passed away uh, two weeks ago. Uh, even he <laughs> only do three years of PhD, uh, he get a lot of fast L from in many fundamental work in optimization. For example, the first talk by. Alexander already talked about his work on matrix scaling. It is a very basic question. And this talk, I will talk about our work on LP regression. And in this Tuesday, everyone will talk about uh, how to solve stationary, how to compute stationary distribution in linear, linear time for any directed graph. And clearly, this is also very fundamental. And he has many, many fundamental work just in three years. For example, he got the first polynomial time construction on Ramanujan graph. This problem has been studied by many mathematicians and computer scientists for many decades, and he first got a polynomial time. And for example, he, he and with Alex and a few collaborators got faster L form for unit capacity mean cost flow. Also, he got the the current, he still have the current record for the fastest album for solving Laplacian and many, many other poems. Uh, in fact, I suspect he will have, I don't know how many more papers next year will coming up. Uh, because he worked with a lot of people and in fact, he had a lot of secret results with other researchers because when people ask him questions, he has a constant probability of solving it uh, instantly. And when it happens, then he has a little secret result with that collaborator. And so I don't know how many results he has more next year. And maybe I'll tell you about what is my first research with him. Uh, so my first research with him is again about regression poem, but this is an L2 regression poem. So the problem is very simple. I just leave one notation. I call T M N Z is the time to solve a uh, linear regression with M constraint, M rebel, and Z many long zero. Here I focus on L form with converging weights log one over epsilon because it is log converging. So I will not talk about epsilon here, but there is some log term flowing around. And basically, our result is just this sentence. If you want to solve an m by m matrix, you just need to read the matrix a few <laughs> times and solve an m by m matrix. And we don't need to assume any assumption on the matrix. Uh, 
and just within a few years, this has been a standard tool for solving many algorithms, uh, especially because this algorithm is uh, very simple. It just involves sampling the matrix and then use the sample matrix to figure out which constraint is important and then do something again. And, and the funny thing I want to talk about this research is originally we have a kind of a hacky proof, but he never settled with a simple proof. Usually whatever proof he got usually is the correct proof. And for this one, he got a two sentence proof for this, this result. Just to give you a background about this poem, before our results say it's an even more complicated paper, like 50 page or something like this. And at the end, he just got two sentences. And however, I will not talk about this. It involves some, some very careful definition to get that two sentences. Uh, so I always suspect, in fact, he has a book, uh, but just we cannot see it. Uh, so, uh, except for being a really good uh, uh, problem solver, he is also a very good listener. Uh, one special thing about him is he never lead a whiteboard to listen to proof. Even you have a very complicated proof with long formula, what he prefer to do is just walking around the hall and then when you tell him, then he suddenly understand even for a very long proof. I remember this summer, Santos is visiting MS Hour and we have some 10 page proof of something. And then he just walk around and listen for the, that 10 page. And then he gives some very valuable uh, uh, recommendation how to improve the proof. So it's really amazing. Uh, and the another thing is he is really good on finding mistake in a proof. Even though he never need to read the proof, he can still find a mistake. I remember this summer I, I was solving a poem and I was very excited because some, some important poem and I was trying to explain him. And usually he can understand immediately, but this time I'm a little bit frustrated because he couldn't understand. And I also told Sebastian him about the proof and he is also happy. And a few days later we found a mistake. But John Kellner didn't seem too happy either. Huh? John Kellner doesn't seem too happy either. <laughs> oh, because at that time I'm doing my thesis defense. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> uh, yeah, he found quite a few mistakes in my paper. And there is one time I don't know how to fix the mistake and he can fix it. Uh, so it's really amazing. And uh, certainly the la last really special Ability of him is he can solve problem immediately. Uh, this summer, I, again, I tell him uh, uh, some math problem which is open for two decades. <coughs> and then uh, after I told him, the next day morning, he tell me a proof. Uh, so it's kind of crazy. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, if you have students and don't know what paper to read, one suggestion is to read his paper Many of his paper is very elegant and short, so it is really good. So today my talk is a whiteboard talk. Uh, so how to disable the screen? So the problem we want to study is uh, very simple. Uh, the problem is just this. Our goal is to minimize the uh, LP regression. Uh, where say A is uh, N by D matrix, there is N constraint and D variables. And our goal is to get the log 1 of epsilon convergence type L form. And why we care about this form? So let me give you some background. For example, if you want to solve a L1 regression, then what you can do is uh, you can solve it in uh, 
screw the uh, iteration and each iteration just involving solving some linear system and similarly for L2 that everyone know this is just a linear system you can, so you can solve it in one and for L infinity is again squared t and so one natural question is uh, how about p uh, not in those range and before our our result the current best algorithm is uh, formally is, the, is uh, the previous best formally is squared d n but if you uh, the previous result is a recent improvement on LP and if you uh, work on those alpha, you probably can also move those results here then you will get squared d but it is kind of unnatural for example if p is 2.001 then you should expect you get something closer to 1 instead of still something square root and in this result we have uh, this result is still not on yet uh, and the key part is this John Wolf with Cohen and our result is showing we can do it in n to so yes a lateral result you should expect when p is close to 2, then it is something close to 0. And certainly, one open question you can, can ask is, uh, is, can you improve that to d? Uh, because uh, in practice, many data set there is much more constraint than variables. <coughs> so this certainly is interesting. But I will only focus on this. And uh, one may question why this is difficult. For example, can you just use the Intel Pro method to get this result? And it turns out we also put a lower bound. Uh, 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 cannot get this. Uh, uh, formally, what we prove here is uh, for those who know Intel Pro method, uh, they work by you. You have a convex problem, and you consider the self-coordinate Berry function for that convex set, and then use the Lewis method to solve the problem with the Berry function. And what we prove here is there is no uh, good self-coordinate Berry function for LP ball, even for L two point zero one ball. So this is our result. Is that, is that for p bigger than two only? Uh, for P is one, then it's still one half. Minus, right? No, it's minus. No, it's minus. Is it absolute right? Yeah, it's absolute right. Oh, absolute right. Yeah. Yeah, so let me try to explain why this problem is difficult. Clearly, given the correct problem, the most natural way to solve a problem is by using grade, by using gradient descent. So let's see what is the problem of using gradient descent for this problem. So uh, let me see. Uh, say we for this talk, S is the slack. You can think S is always like uh, AX minus B. And our problem is to study a convex problem look, look like this, x to the p. And, and the reason why you cannot solve, uh, solve LP regression using gradient descent is because this function is not really well behaved. Uh, more particular, a one s is zero. Uh, uh, this function is not, uh, let me see, it's not uh, smooth for p less than, strictly less than 2 because the function is more look like absolute value. Um, for, for p greater than 2, then the problem is it's not uh, Johnny Converse. So our idea is kind of really natural. We just try to modify the function such that the function is 
Oh, in this talk, I will focus on this case because in every sentence, I need to switch between two cases differently, so I only talk about one case, but the proof is basically the same. Uh, for example, in this case, then what we want to do is to make a function slightly more strongly convex. So, uh, turns out uh, the way we do this is say I put the function f, the derivative of s, which we can calculate is something look like this. And when you put the graph of the derivative of the x to the p, the part is something look like this. Uh, Remember, it's p larger than zero. So, around here, the function is look like fat. Especially, imagine this is a thousand here. Then this is look like straight line around zero, and this create the issue for gradient descent. And what we do is something like this. Uh, we look at some parameter t here. We want to modify the function such that this is strongly convex. In the picture of derivative, then what we want to do is to make the derivative look like straight line. When it's a strict line, it's a quadratic function. So what we do is just to find a strict line, this one. And then we pay the origin function by this function, going from here to here, and then strict line, and then going up. And in terms of formula, the function is something look like this. <coughs> I draw here. I call that function ft. Then the derivative is just this. There is two cases. When s is less than t, then we want a straight line. Uh, s, do I have to? Yeah. And otherwise, it's something like this. So our idea is try to solve the LP regression by respecting the function by another function ft. That is more strongly convex around the zero. And uh, certainly, you can integrate this function and get the origin form. Uh, uh, so you notice this formula is quadratic. Because it's strict down here, so the function itself is quadratic around zero. And everywhere else is just the origin function and shift by a little bit. Uh, one particular nice feature about this function <coughs> is that, uh, uh, for example, f infinity is just uh, is just equals to the origin function, and oh, l f zero it should be f zero. F zero is the origin function because we left a modify. What I'm drawing. F0 is just the origin fun. Wait, uh, yeah. And F infinity is quadratic. So, uh, because we want modify the function, so you can, if you just solve for one function, then you didn't get the exact uh, solution. So, what we do is we start with a quadratic function, which we know how to solve and then gradually decrease the parameter t while maintaining the solution of the problem. So in some sense, it's kind of like the interior problem method, but instead of coming up with a barrier, what we do is we find a family of function, approximate the origin function, and gradually maintaining the solution. Uh, yeah, so the alpha is this. Uh, when you start with a very large t, basically you start with a t large enough such that you can provably prove the solution of the ft is inside the quadratic area. That means your problem is just a quadratic problem, so you just solve by using a linear system. Okay, let me divide. Yeah, we are solving this problem. Uh, We start with some very large uh, T for our uh, linear system. So, uh, 
so then the album is kind of like uh, in two point while T is uh, larger than some vessel. The each iteration, the fun fact here is what we do is a long step in two point each album. Each step we will just do something like this. This step is pretty large, it's constant. And then uh, and each step our album is very simple. We just use the you use the exact gradient descent to find the legs XT uh, with the initial solution uh, the last the last X you get and this is basically the alpha. Uh, so in terms of oh, this talk I try to usually when I give a talk people complain I'm too fast so this time I try to be slow. <laughs> That's why I use a whiteboard. Uh, Hopefully it's better. Uh, so in terms of picture, you can think the say the the x infinity is just a quadratic solution of some quadratic problem you can solve, and then in some sense x t is like a path, and each time you decreasing the t and then gradually converging the the solution. And to analyze such an alpha mod, you need to prove is basically every step the the solution is close enough. And then you want to prove when it's close enough, then the palm here locally is look like a well-conditioned palm, and that's why exaggerated design can solve very efficiently. So that is the pen. Uh, yeah. Huh. And what? Is it important to use accelerated gradient descent or just? Uh, yeah, a uh, lot important. You just square the running time. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, it's not important because what we prove is uh, exact gradient descent will give a result like this with some log. Uh, instead, you can use exact SVRG, some stochastic gradient descent alpha. And uh, what it gives is even more interesting. It will give a running time. I don't even remember, uh, but it's roughly look like this. <laughs> the, the thing I don't remember is the exponent, uh, so it will be some, something related to P. <laughs> the formula is more complicated, but uh, oh, and Z is the uh, number of long zero in, <coughs> in A. So this is linear time plus uh, some polynomial in B. And also, one thing to emphasize here, especially, is this is not one of epsilon convergence. So if you have much more constraint than variables, then this is basically linear time. And what this is interesting is because uh, this is the this is the second example of such such running time. Uh, Currently, we only know such running time for L2 regressing, and turns out this is also holds for LP regressing. Uh, oh, oh uh, this this exponent on P will also blow up when P tends to one, uh, so it only holds between P from one and infinity. Otherwise, you will solve LP in input sparsity. Uh, yeah, and certainly one really major problem, at least for me in Intel for solving linear programs is can you solve LP in such one and time? Um, yeah, in this talk I will only focus on this part. The, the second thing is running time and the first one is number of iterations. Yeah, good. The first one is about iterations. So now we go to the proof. Hopefully, I can give a complete proof. Uh, yeah. So, so basically, there is only one lemma in the proof. <coughs> we all know whatever paper by Cohen, it will be simple. So this paper is also simple. Uh, so the proof involves one one concept. Uh, is a uh, is a L infinite neighborhood of a solution. Uh, so we call uh, neighborhood center at S with radius R is this. 
So I will I will use the notation for s and x because s is always given by ax minus b. So you can also think this neighborhood is defined for x. So the neighborhood is this the set of s prime such that uh, s prime this is coordinate wise uh, p over two. I still don't have a real uh, intuition of y is p over two. But this comes from the proof. Uh, so this is the neighborhood. And the main name is just this. Uh, if you, uh, for h less than something like 1 over 2p, uh, after you do one step, this one should be t. Then it is close to the origin point with the distance with distance look like this p mean high or polynomial dependence on p and 1 minus p p minus 1 uh, yeah so this is the main lemma of the proof so I will first show why this uh, lemma suffice yeah so this proof is basically showing every point is in the L infinity ball of the previous pawn, and the radius in this metric is something look like this. Uh, so, yeah, so let's see why it suffice. So, remember what we are trying to minimize is this function. Uh, 1 to n f t s i. So when you compute the Hessian of this, then it is something look like this. Basically, this formula is saying uh, the Hessian is roughly involve the Hessian of F and with some matrix inside and outside. And what we want to prove is when you take a step, then the Hessian doesn't change too much. And so, And yeah, the formula of f double prime is still so. So we need to compute f double prime. F double prime is just uh, uh, because the first part is co you notice the f double prime. If you differentiate this, this term is just something like t to p minus two. And for this part, when you differentiate, it is uh, something like a, also s p over two. So the so the formula is roughly like this. Just to simplify the notation, uh, you will have some people along you there, but I will not care about those. All the proof I will try to avoid writing those p better except in the exponent. So basically, there is two cases because we recognize the function to make sure it's always Johnny convex. So the second derivative is always larger than t to the p minus 2. Otherwise, it's like the origin function. And so if we apply this formula, what happens is this. Uh, the second derivative is uh, first, we need to upper bound and lower bound this to, to estimate how fast the gradient descent converge. So for the upper bound, then because s can only move by this amount, so it will upper bound by something like this. Uh, the s p over two can move by this factor, and because the second derivative is the exponent is p over two, so you need to ex Exponentiate this term by one minus four over p, I guess. Two, two. Okay. And similarly, you can lower bound by something look like this. <coughs> so the worst case for. This thing is what is the s such that the, the 
the ratio between upper bound and lower bound is the worst is the case where s is exactly t because when this term is lower than t then lower bound is always larger than the t factor so basically the okay maybe i call this term is alpha and this term is beta then what we have is something like this alpha over beta is upper bound by uh, upper bound the worst case is the denominator is t to the p over 2 p minus 2 and the numerator is something like s p over 2 plus oh and when this term equals to that then the s is something like t p over 2 so this term is also like t p over 2 and then you have 2 square and t <coughs> And, and the t term will cancel away and this term is just roughly n to 1 minus 2 over p. So the conditional number for this system, if we can prove this neighborhood, then the conditional number is n to 1 minus 2 over p. And if you use exact gradient descent, then it's this one in time. So basically, it reduced to this lemma. I'm a little bit confused about the equation. So s is a vector, right? So yeah. And it does always the superscript and subscript, like a 1 minus ht, like a, like, I think you have i sub i, that sounds like the i's correct. Yeah, right? yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah, then I should have all the subscript i everywhere. I see. Yeah. Oh, did, yeah. So, oh. Basically, all calculation is coordinate wise. Yeah, so we only have... Oh, one funny thing is, uh, notice, uh, when you prove exaggerated descent, one catches here. Imagine if the uh, gradient descent leaves this region, then this estimate is already false. So what you need to... Uh, so you need to fix the problem such that even though we only prove the op, the region containing op and current pond have well conditioned. We want to make sure the whole problem is well conditioned. And what you can do is, for example, imagine, just imagine here, say we have, just let's say we have a one dimension convex problem we want to solve. Let's say you are here the initial point. And let's say you promise the obvious here. And say we already know the problem is well conditioned here and but crazy outside. But what, what you can do is you, you find the quadratic function such that it quadratically extend the function outside this region. Also, you can out, extend outside this region. And what after doing this operation, then the whole problem is well conditioned. And basically, you can do the same check here and make sure the whole problem is well conditioned. And that's why the one in time is like this. Why don't you add a constraint instead? Oh. Oh, but the constraint will be, the constraint is, the constraint will look like this form and it is pretty difficult to... Because this is, the what we extend is on the S, but the problem is on X, yeah. Do, do we need any condition of the matrix A? It sounds like it, it's not relevant. Oh, so what we, more precisely, what we do each iteration is we, we will transform the spaces that the initial point the hessian is identity and run the exaggerating design. Otherwise, you, in the L form, you should solve some linear system somewhere. Otherwise, you need to make assumption on the matrix. Yeah, so in the last 10 minutes, I will prove this lemma. Uh, this lemma does not require too much intuition. What you need to do is you just write down the ODE for the S and then estimate that, that ODE. So we can do the calculation. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. But I guess it is a good calculus exercise. Uh, so in general, to figure out uh, the dynamic for auto automatic condition, what you can do is simply take the derivative on the automatic condition. 
So we call our poem, uh, we are solving this poem, A transport X minus B. So we want to understand how, how the ST change. So what you do is write down the KKT for this. Uh, that will be A transpose uh, F prime T S I equals to zero. Now you take derivative of this guy, you get A transpose F prime prime. Oh, when you take, I, I should always use T. Remember, there is two things related to T, so when you take derivative, there is two terms. For we first take derivative of s, then you get x double prime a and d s uh, d s t d t, and when you take derivative of uh, the f prime, then you get uh, uh, something like this. And using the fact s is a x must be, then you will get something like this. Uh, uh, d x t d t oh this is zero so you can move that term there then you can invert that matrix there uh, I will start ignoring those part, those things just for rotation convenience Uh, one trick for bounding into Palm F4 is try to make a term look like projection matrix and then ignore that term. And uh, this is not exactly projection matrix, so what you do is apply A on both sides. When you apply A, then you get better uh, uh, ST. Then here you will get A term here. But this guy is still not a projection matrix. So what you do is you create an F prime prime term on both left and right. So you create an F square f prime prime and then here you need to give it back and this is a projection operator now we can start bounding the l2 lump of this guy yeah uh, because this is projection matrix so the lump of this dominated by the last term and that is here this is where our formula of f is important. Uh, so let me see the formula of f is now important. Uh, we have a formula here. Um, we will compute, say, f prime prime. Oh, did I already compute that? Yeah, I compute that. Uh, P minus 2, I guess. And, and also, you need to compute the derivative of F prime in terms of T. And this one is just, uh, yeah. The talk will finish in a few seconds, I guess. <laughs> no. Yeah, you differentiate T here, then you will get P minus 3. Oh, di differentiate this. Here, P minus 3. And this term is not depends on T, so it is zero. And now you can compute that term. I mean this term. Uh, so here, uh, F prime dt over square F prime prime is bounded by this divided by that. Uh, so this will be uh, this divided by that. Make sure this is correct. So this is oh S is bounded by T because another case is zero. So this term is basically T P minus two, and you divide by square P minus two, so it is P P minus two over two. Back to this board on the left, and, and say like don't explain any of the calculations. Just say what's happening. So what it happens is just up to up to this formula, we are just computing the formula of how x change, right. and then 
and then afterward is you just try to bind this by how much F is changing. And now we are bounding how much F is changing. Yeah. And why were you doing this? Uh, because we want to prove after one step, S does not change too much. And so it is in the neighborhood such that the problem is still well conditioned. And so the accelerating descent will converge fast. Oh yeah, so basically with that, now we are using on that sentence and you get a uh, square f prime prime ds dt two long years. Because it's coordinate bounds by that term, so for L2 long years just add uh, extra, extra square n factor. And basically that is uh, done. Uh, that, because of this L2 long bound, we know coordinate wise, we use the worst case infinity long of this is bounded by L2 long. And uh, so this will be. But remember, you need to divide by the Hessian. So again, you have two cases. The first case, the Hessian is just T. Uh, Why something is funny? Oh, and the funny thing is the Hessian square of Hessian is exactly this term. <coughs> so for the first case, it's just square n. And the second case is something like this. Now we have the uh, bound on the derivative of s. Then you just in integrate along the path and you will get this. Yeah, this is the proof. Any questions? So maybe I'll let two, how much extent this can be generalized? Say if the, each FT is like LP com, strongly convex and LP smooth. Uh, what is LP strongly convex? Uh, say that the oh. upper bounded, you know, the lower bounded by the LP. But, but do you, when you, a function cannot be both LP strongly convex uh, and LP smooth? There is a gap. Okay. Uh, then my next question is, suppose the function is LP strongly convex and LQ smooth? Because <laughs> <laughs> this proof seems very generic, right? Yeah. Uh, the thing you just proved on the left seems to imply. I, I don't know. Uh, I also don't feel this proof is too gen generic. The problem is for any other function, I try to generalize this proof. I cannot find any function satisfy those assumptions. Uh, but the smoothing technique here is generic, right? Yeah, there's, yeah but, but uh, the key problem is you want to find a problem such that the change of the derivative is bounded by the, the Hessian. In some sense, this one looks kind of similar to the self concordance. Yeah. Maybe another interesting question is whether you can do it for logistic version. Uh, this one, I am pretty sure, no, uh, I believe logistic regression is as general as LP. Imagine if, because the logistic regression function is something look like this, and if your scale is really far away, then the logistic regression is just like value, and value is just like L1. And so I don't think it's easy to get anything better for logistic. Okay, but I guess you can assume something on the on data. Yeah, sure. Yeah, then then I don't know. Then maybe. Any other questions? Yeah. Does this extend to a slightly general problem where you have minimizing a linear function subject to some equality, linear equality constraint and then the cone, and then the x is in the LP cone. Oh, you mean this? LP, uh, j just say this is less than one, something like this? Something like that, yeah. Uh, basically, you can always write, okay. So first of all, this, the whole talk can generalize if you add a linear constraint on the LP, linear cost into the regression. And this problem and that problem is equivalent because you can just, in some sense, move this term here. Yeah, yeah. 
But then you add the infinity here, then it will be equality, and then you can also move that term here, then they will be equivalent. And then uh, one other thing, so I, I'm trying to understand. So for the uh, self-concordance parameter, what you are saying that you have proved that for anything other than 2, it is bounded by n? So what we prove is for LP cone, if P is log 2, and if your barrier fencing is symmetric, symmetric, namely the barrier fencing is yeah, yeah. this, yeah, yeah. Then, then it's at, at least n times some p factor. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have this, we can put n to one third lower bound. 20 year open problems, that's interesting. Uh, we have a break now and the next talk will start at 3.15.